Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 533. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's September the 13th, 2019. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, clergy and laity alike, welcome to another program, the Friday program. Before we get started, you probably want to know, hey, how can I help? Well, you could give us money. Uh, you can find the donate link on anglican.inc uh, forward slash donate. There's a little, a little button there you can help donate to the program, and we'll be uh, seeking that for travel next year as we go out to Lambeth and other places. But first and foremost, we need you to get the 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 message out about the program. So if you could share us on Facebook and share us with your friends by clicking the little share button, that'd be great. If you could like the episode, and that's the thumbs up, that's the like, don't do this one. That's not good at all. You do the like button on Facebook and YouTube. Also, participate in the comments. We got lots of great discussions going on and updates in the comments in the last three or four episodes. Uh, we're getting like 80 to 100 comments per episode. That's awesome. And that's showing that you're being a participant in how the show goes and keeping the conversation going even after I click the record button off. Gentlemen, I hope you all had wonderful weeks like I've had. Uh, George, what you been up to? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I know. Oh, I'm I need to. I'm, I, I'm muting my phone right now. Okay, go. <laughs> no, no, I uh, actually had to write to Gavin to ask him his priestly Episcopal advice Ooh. how to approach uh, an issue of uh, well, someone came asking for their house to be cleansed of demons, and I went through the process: is this drugs? Is this mental illness? Is this sure. truly satanic? And I didn't just run over wag my thumb, sprinkle some water, and say, okay, you're done, you're fine. But I actually had to, uh, my experience in the deliverance ministry is not extensive, and so I had to reach out to people whom I trust, whose counsel I needed, and uh, praise God, this is going to be an ongoing work that well, I think will take some time. Yeah, but, sure. uh, but well, okay, here's, friends, if you need advice, call, call the man. Which way are you, Gavin? I can't see on the screen. Call this man. <laughs> You should be able to see this. Um, Gavin, you were traveling this week. Uh, you went uh, to Jersey. How'd that go? I feel so stupid, Kevin. <laughs> I was very pleased to get an invitation to go back to Jersey because I haven't been back since I left uh, and take part in, a, in, in an, an island-wide debate on euthanasia. And so I said to the Lord, well, this is an opportunity maybe to save lives. I should go. And um, but what I, <laughs> I'm very naive. What I hadn't realized was that the people who were asked me to do it were, were the Euthanasia Society. So it was their idea, and they hired the theater, and they set it up, they did the publicity. So, of course, the place was completely full of their supporters. This was their, this was their sort of their shop window. And they got the uh, senior director from Dignitas, Switzerland, to come and explain how beautifully they did it all. And uh, they had um, a very nice uh, gay activist who's a senior reporter on the island chair the whole thing. No tension between him and me whatsoever. Actually, I like him very much, but on the other hand, there was, there was some scope for a little bit of friction if either of us had been less affectionate to each other than we were. Uh, and, and, and me, and I realized I, I was a kind of patsy. You were but set up. Yeah. I was set up. The, 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 but, and the speeches were okay. In fact, I was very grateful because... It, gave me the opportunity to do a lot more thinking and research about it. And um, I'm much clearer in my own why, in my own mind, why assisted dying as well as euthanasia <clears throat> are so problematic. What one group ask, a, a strong group of people in society ask a weaker group to pay the price for their choices. But um, in the questions, well, people were very aggressive indeed. And well, they were really quite rude. And uh, I, I was I was I was a bit taken aback. It was just Daniel in the lion's den. So um, I had great fun. I learned a great deal. I, I saw some old Christian friends, and uh, I prayed a lot. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, I learned a lot. Kevin, I'm going to argue with you. You were as much a patsy as Paul was when he went to the Agora in Athens. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because you do not know uh, the results of your speaking the truth in love to these people. Uh, the, the response you get reminds me of that passage where somebody shouts to Jesus, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? <laughs> go, away, yeah, go away. Go away. Uh, oh, and geez. 
we we can't uh, we can't gauge uh, the effectiveness of our spiritual walk and witness by the uh, volume of applause. We can only see it over time as lives are changed and people are turned around. And it doesn't matter uh, if only one person is prevented from taking their life because of the words you spoke this week. I, 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 I it's became a thousand very, or one, it doesn't matter. I became very clear in my own mind that one of the effects of allowing assisted suicide would be that although it gave some people a right they didn't yet have to ease their way out of suffering that appears to be meaningless and just mean, it immediately places in front of everybody else the option of that choice when they neither want it nor should have it. And so the, you know, the, the price is being borne by people who are vulnerable and inevitably an, old, an elderly person uh, who is using up too many, too many resources and, and feeling very bad about the, the way in which attention and resources are focused on them to have them have to live with the fact that there is a choice that they could take themselves out of here, that they're not exercising, is, is to place a huge burden on people that should just never be there, mm -hmm. simply to allow a small group of, of clear-minded, determined, proud people a choice they want to make. So once again, it, it's, it's, um, it's the strong wanting rights at the expense of the weak. And of course, there's no sense of the sanctity of life anymore in our in our culture and uh, to, one has to find ways of of um of introducing the concept and in case anyone hasn't read it yet tom holland's new book dominion uh which which uh, gives a wonderful sense of the vi viability of christian culture compared to the romans and the greeks it's just being published yeah but i'm interested what what did these people uh were you able to raise the recent case in vancouver where the government is essentially telling a man with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease that we're not going to pay for your care anymore, so you basically your choice is kill yourself or kill yourself. How I do did. these activists respond to the change from I have mm. uh, uh, autonomy to make this choice to at a certain point the government's going to make me do this, kill myself well, to save me? The Vancouver case is actually quite quite mild uh, compared to the aberrations that have taken place in Holland and in Belgium. Belgium has now moved uh, assisted suicide from physiological complaints to psychological ones. That means if you're depressed, you don't want to live, you see no purpose in living, you come within the scope of the law. They've moved it from uh, adults down into teenagers. That means children who are depressed can use the law to say, I don't want to be here anymore. Uh, a woman in, in Holland recently had dementia and the doctor decided that because she'd given her permission in a will 10 years ago, she would have that permission could be counted on. So he had to hold her down and he asked her family to hold her down whilst he uh, inflicted the fatal dose on her. She didn't, she objected then, but because she had dementia, her objections weren't taken any account of. That anybody who knows anything about human nature knows that our capacity for uh, for mission creep is is endless and the idea that just by passing laws you then don't end up by dealing well in Vancouver with with problematic administrators who have budgets and targets to meet uh, on the one hand the idea that you don't do that is extraordinary but the audience didn't want to hear we want our rights we want the right to avoid pain and suffering and and no unintended consequences are going to stop us. And, and there the was a doctor from Vancouver there. He said, I've just flown over here. I've opened the newspaper and you have said horrid things about my city. Couldn't you have chosen another city? I said, well, I guess I could have picked on Seattle if they'd done something stupid like that. But it was Vancouver where it happened. There just was no sense of the of, of the issues as they impacted other people. And, uh, you know, pride and autonomy were everything. That's the rallying cry we've always heard with abortion. We want it to be legal, but rare. We are just there for the people who really, 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 really need it. And apparently one million people a year need it. And if we're gonna find that same thing with assisted suicide, it's just there for the rare occasion. And boom, you're gonna find people lining up because they didn't get their homework done and they're afraid to go to school that day. And it's, it's the simplicity of the human mind. Uh, as you probably saw on Facebook, the uh, 
<clears throat> rumors of my death are greatly exaggerated. I had a little incident with a, uh, a car on Wednesday at September 11th. I got to meet the first responders. They showed up at my uh, car bicycle accident where I became a hood ornament on a, uh, a 2019 uh, Jeep Cherokee. That was a lot of fun. I'm showing some pictures here. This is the car that uh, turned right in front of me as I was going across an intersection. and hit my bicycle, you're looking at my broken bike there, and now you get to look at my uh, leg, and that's uh, been bruised by hitting the front grill of the car. Oh, I, yeah, thank yeah. God it was a, a Jeep, not a Rolls Royce or a oh, Bentley, yeah, because you could have failed a flying <laughs> or a winged victory lady. <laughs> it was thank a God. bug on this guy's wheel, windshield. It's amazing, he wasn't texting. I, you know, We made eye contact as I, I hit the car, and uh, he was doing about 10 and I was doing about 15 and it may as well have been a train. That was, that's a hard impact. Uh, but I didn't have that let life go in before my eyes thing. That was just a, a, my helmet hitting the, the, uh, the hood and cracking open. And look at the damage this little tiny body did to that hood. You know, cars aren't made like the way <laughs> they used to be. Gentlemen, let's move on to the news. I'm going over here and the show notes but, say... But before you do, Kevin, I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure that, that lots of people will have the feelings that I have and want to say, thank God you're alive. Oh, absolutely. Thank God you're, thank God you're in one piece. Mm -hmm. And thank God the mental damage that's sustained has only had the effect of making you do retakes four or five times this afternoon. <laughs> it could have been much worse. <laughs> very, very, very grateful you're still alive. <laughs> And, well, any, and, and if Morgan and Morgan have not yet contacted you about your accident, I'm sure Morgan that and Morgan and Sue just Morgan called. Yeah, they're looking. We'll be calling you. <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, I, I have to get a new bike. I took a nice trip to the hospital. I was it's my first ambulance trip in a long time, and um, it's just one of those situations. I enjoy going for a bike ride here on the shore. It's safe to ride the bike. However. I was anticipating a car always coming up from the back of me and bumping me. I uh, have this attached to the back of my bicycle. This is a Garmin radar. It has a light um, that flashes when the car gets too close. And so as the car is approaching, this little radar thing picks it up and starts flashing. I'm sure I'm boring the people. But it also tells me on my little computer here, hey, you got a car coming up. You've and just sent our epileptic viewers into a catatonia. <laughs> I did the same to myself. I now have red flashing in my head. Oh, that's great. And on my computer here, it will tell me that how many cars are coming up behind me, where they are, and how fast they're coming. I, I never anticipated somebody turning right in front of me. How, how did you miss me? I'm a little bit overweight. I wear a bright shirt. Come on already. But yeah, that's the way it happens. And uh, so now I have a white light that flashes on the front of my bicycle for those people who just don't have time to pay attention while they're well, driving. Well, let's look at it this way. In the, within the last 12 months, Gavin, is it three or four eye surgeries and a hip surgery? Sure. Uh, three uh, eyes and, and one hip, yes. And, <laughs> and you were, essentially you were close to death uh, at one point, I recall, or at yeah. least with the color of a dead body. I was in the hospital for four weeks last year with septicemia and almost died. And now, Kevin, you're about to be run over by a Jeep. Uh, yeah. It's. Yeah. Uh, it, I think we should all start buying life insurance at this point. Because <laughs> somebody's going to have a great payout in the short term. I do have key man insurance for my company, but I don't have any of that type mm. of insurance for Anglican TV. Somebody's just going to have to pick up the pieces if, if, I, if I fall apart here. Yes, but do, and as George is talking about, please keep us in your prayers. This is not uh, anything that a normal person should expect in life. However, if you're on the front lines of what's happening with the church, I bet this is pretty commonplace. And pray for us, pray for the people on the front lines. And if you get a chance to thank a firefighter or a policeman for their service, please do so. Gavin, George, our hero, Justin Welby, was in India. Just, uh, can you give us a quick update on that, George? Justin Welby is on a whirlwind safari starting in the south. He's worked his way up then through the Church of South India, and he's now reached the far north. He's in Amritsar, and he is on the Great White Man Apology Tour, apologizing for the sins of colonialism, for the British Empire, for imposing Christianity on the poor, ignorant Indian masses. 
I'm being using hyperbole there, a little but bit. it speaks to my view of what he's doing. And he topped it off in 1919, uh, an independence rally in Amritsar, which is a Sikh majority, which, which is dominated by Sikhs, was broken up by a British Army general with uh, Gurkha and Baluchi soldiers. Several dozens of people were killed. It was a very famous massacre. And Justin and Winston Churchill and Lord Curzon, uh, at the time, apologized in Parliament before it, but that was not good enough. And so Justin Welby, on behalf of England and the Church of England and the British Empire and the King Emperor, apologized deeply, humbly, prostrating himself uh, in his uh, cassock before the memorial to the dead Indians. Um, this makes good TV in Islington. But what this does in India to the Christian minority is paint a really big bullseye on their back. And would, it's not very well considered in the political religious context of India right now. I, th this is so serious, we have to take a moment to, to, to consider and not just uh, offer the reflex criticism that springs so easily to mind. But I, I, was, I was trying to think as he planned this, who, who this was sub aimed at as, a, as an exercise, um, because it's very hard to understand uh, the impact, the, the, any vir virtuous impact that virtue um, signaling can have had. One of the things that's been suggested to, to us is that this has made life very difficult for indigenous Indian Christians because the media impact of a, of a white ex-colonial uh, British English Archbishop coming uh, means that the association of Christianity is, is indelibly associated with him, with Englishness, uh, and with the Church of England, with Anglicanism. But actually, Christians in India uh, are some of the oldest Christian communities in the world. There's, there's a, a, a legend, and it's more than a legend, that Thomas evangelized India, and, and the Ma Thomas Indian Christian communities go back to the first century. That's when Christianity arrived. They've been continuously there flourishing, evangelizing, and living. They got nothing to do with 19th century English colonialists and their archbishop successors. What does Welby think he's doing, putting his proprietorial stamp on Christianity and making a, an indelible link between indigenous, uh, overriding the, 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 the indigenous Indian spirituality with this link with colonialism in order to apologize for it? In other words, he's creating the very problem that he's pretending or, or endeavoring to try and solve. This is really a, 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 I was say it's a silly thing to do, I mean, but it's much more than that. Once again, we have power, it's, it's the same argument as assisted suicide. We have powerful and privileged people, Welby in the Church of England, making an advantage for themselves in terms of their virtuousness at the expense of other people who are weaker and in some trouble. And Christians are an enormous amount of trouble at the hands of Hindus. Uh, uh, and Hindu nationalists who are who are persecuting them and giving them a very difficult time. It's hard to understand why Welby and his advisors thought this was an okay thing to do. Well, I think the the important thing here at, that we see is virtue signaling. You know, Welby is the Archbishop of Canterbury, asterisk virtue signaler. Uh, he's done this throughout his administration, where he said, "Listen." We are no longer going to invest stocks in coal. We're no longer going to invest stocks in payday loans. We're no longer, you know, all these things throughout time. He's uh, set out the Church of England to change. And I think it's all just been virtually signaling because in the end, nothing changes. And what continues is this past week, 500, a mob of 500 Hindu radicals burned down a Jesuit run college in mm -hmm. Jakarand in Eastern mm -hmm. India. This didn't make the news really anywhere because it is so commonplace. Uh, the BJP, uh, the government of uh, Prime Minister Modi, is based upon Hindu nationalism, and one of the one of the central beliefs of the Hindu nationalist leadership and its activists is that Christianity is a foreign Western influence mm -hmm. that must be stamped down. So, Archb so the Archbishop of Canterbury, who when he was in London said, I'm not going to talk about anything political, 
I'm not going to raise the persecution of Christians. I'm not going to get into Indian politics. He does the exact opposite with his actions mm. by basically teeing one up for Indian Hindu nationalists to say, look, here's the head of the Church of England, who's the head of Anglicans, which is, we're going to call them the head of the Church of North India and the Church of South India. Here's the head, and he's tying this church to the state as the church and state being one. Therefore, your Christian neighbors in India are really agents of a foreign power, mm. and they must be stamped out. And how are they stamped out? Through violence. Uh, Uttar Pradesh, I believe, one of the northern Indian states uh, just passed another harsh anti-conversion law where, pre, uh, recent, uh, where clergy are arrested for sharing the news of Jesus Christ. Lay people are arrested for sharing Christian thinking voice, you know, reasons, life, love with non-Christians, and they're being jailed for attempting to convert people. And what, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, I through, think he's ill-advised. I don't think he's an evil man. I just don't think he's very good at what he does. Has basically given another, has given another, added another arrow to the quiver of the Hindu nationalists to attack the local Christians in India. I can't think of another Archbishop who uh, as you see, I will be lying there. The trouble is, it 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 is very me 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 ish. This is, the, this, it's not. It, you might think that by prostrating yourselves with an apology, it's a hum, it's a humble act, but it's but it's terribly. Um, look 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 at me make this significant act. I can't see uh, uh, any of the previous archbishops in our generation. Or any before that, doing such a thing, drawing such attention to themselves, and making such an ill-advised um, uh, act of act of so-called contrition. Well, you know, Rome Williams would would never have done it. No, nor Michael Ramsey. But I could see Michael Curry doing this. I could see Catherine Jefferts Shore doing this. I could see Pope Francis doing this. So essentially, it's 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 a piece of spirituality associated to, with progressive politics. Mm. Oh, progressive politics. I got one for you guys. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw the story, but Virginia Theological Seminary has decided and voted upon with the board of directors to pay out reparations for all the slaves who helped build the seminary many years ago. I think it was 18, oh, early 1800s they were built. Was that right, George? Who knows, 1802 or something like that. And uh, they said, listen, we feel guilty we now have a board of directors full of white people. We are going to pay reparations to all the people. Well, I guess we can't find them, but the descendants of the slaves uh, who helped build this. Tell us a little bit about the story, George. Yes, it's essentially, as you say, the uh, board, the, the, the seminary voted to set aside $1.7 million as reparations for the indignities uh, vested upon slaves who helped build and support the seminary before the American Civil War. Now, they're not the first institution to do this. Georgetown University across the river. Uh, the Jesuits lead the way, once again, in progressive virtue signaling. Now, the kicker is, though, George, uh, the Virginia Theological Seminary never actually owned any slaves. <laughs> they had independent contractors who used slave labor to do some of the work. So to identify the actual slaves who built the seminary and who should be recompensed out of this fund is near impossible because they have to basically track down the records of non -ex of independent contractors from 200 years ago. So essentially what uh, Kevin and you and I were chatting about this saying, what this is, this is a wonderful slush fund. We now have $1.7 million set aside for slave reparations. Oops, we can't find any, but now we can spend money and curry favor and make ourselves part of the PC establishment by giving, oh, 100,000 to the NAACP or to this fund or to this political leader, to this or that. Frankly, if I were an alumnus of Virginia Theological Seminary and they sent around a, a begging letter saying, oh, our poor seminarians, uh, the, the ceilings are falling in, they have to use old textbooks and the food is terrible, I would be very hesitant to send them more money. Well, but because that's it's just it's 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 a it's virtue signaling on the wealthy level. Yeah, understand what we're saying here. They will never spend one point seven million dollars on anything. 
That's just the virtual signal. But they're going to get $1.7 million of virtual signaling credit because the New York Times will cover this, all the Virginia papers, Washington, D.C., all the senators and congressmen and politicians who love this sort of thing are going to you know, give hat tips to them. It's worth it to make a press release saying you're going to do it, even though you eventually really never do it. But you're going to look into it. And, you know, I was kind of surprised that Justin Welby didn't offer reparations to the Indian people. But, you know, he could have. Well, the victims of the Amritsar massacre probably could be tracked down. Just saying. Just saying. Uh, what else do we got for some news out there, guys? Let me go look at my page here. Uh, false chip. I got. Yeah, we got some good. We got good DC, news. Right? No, yeah. not all news is bad news. I, mm -hmm. Sometimes we're criticized for focusing on all the gloom and doom. Well, there's a lot out there, and therefore it sort of crowds out the good news. Two, two little fact. Uh, our friend uh, at the IRD, Jeff Walton, had two really neat articles that we we reprinted on Anglican Inc. in recent weeks. One was on uh, the downturn of attendance in the Episcopal Church. But one of the numbers that uh, Jeff sort of put it out was pushed out was that 20% of Episcopal congregations are growing and doing really well, thank you. Now, the story is 80% are going into the tank, but 20% are doing are thriving. They're happy, they're successful, they're growing. That's even in the Episcopal Church. And at Jeff's other great story was about the Falls Church. After seven years in exile, after losing their building in a protracted legal fight, their colonial era building where George Washington was a vestryman all those years ago. This past weekend, they opened a new sanctuary, 2,000 people in attendance, the building seats 1,000 people. Mm. In these seven years, they planted seven or eight new congregations. So what is the fruit of the Falls Church? Growth, vigor, vitality, bringing people to Jesus Christ in the middle of what could have been uh, the destruction of who they were as a church. It's, it's just an extraordinarily good news story of the spirit prevailing in the midst of a secular, hostile environment. I remember all the naysayers when the ACNA was first formed and Bob Duncan said, we're going to plant a thousand churches. And I remember a lot of the Episcopalians, you can't do that. Church planting's too hard. However, the diocese, Bishop uh, Guernsey's diocese, has succeeded and thrived because they had all these church plants on the ground to help form this diocese over time. And I think that's one of the keys here is uh, church planting uh, and souls on the ground. Souls, uh, not feet, uh, souls. Let me, let me take this a bit further because the, sure. there will be some skeptics. I talk about my church growing. And mm -hmm. one of the things Kevin rejoins me is, is, well, you're smack dab in the center of the Bible Belt. You still live in, Christ you still live in Christendom. And that's true. I live in a culture very different from where Kevin is in Connecticut. But if you go out to Los Angeles or California and you look at the Anglicanism out there in the CS Huge. for the C for the hard ground. No, no. What's the name <laughs> of the diocese? C S F four O Church for Serving yeah. Others. Yeah, something like that. They Christ, grow yeah. in, the, in the barren soil of Los Angeles and Orange counties. Yeah. Now, Virginia. Once upon a time was the South, but Northern Virginia definitely is not the South anymore. It's part of the secular Northeast. And in that secular, hard environment, Falls Church planted eight more churches. So it, in other words, we can't just say, oh, the lucky ones are people like me down in Hooterville in Florida, where the you know there's nothing else to do on Sunday morning because the liquor stores are closed, therefore you gotta go to church. Rather, you know, God is working in places that the world would say would be very hostile to the message of Jesus Christ, and they're succeeding. In Southern California, in Washington, in New York City, in Boston. Oh, no, not, we're not seeing massive conversion yet in New England, but God is still active and at work. And he's active on the Internet. Uh, how's your, uh, your um, morning prayer book, uh, your daily readings going, Gavin? Sorry. <clears throat> um, I'm I'm very moved at how many people want to pray, uh, and given an opportunity to pray, will will take it. So, um, a morning prayer on Facebook that uh, it it it's the, the numbers vary, but they're between one and two hundred every day mm. around the world. And um, and I've I've 
I'm very pleased about the way in which I get a range of emails from people saying, I've just picked up a sermon you preached six months ago on, on YouTube. You know, one never knows quite how it fell into their hands. And it spoke to me in exactly the right way because. So this is not this is not, not an applaudit for me, but what it does show is that the Holy Spirit is doing his usual job, which is putting together the right person, the right place at the right time with the right, with the right message. Uh, and the internet provides uh, uh, limitless opportunities for the Holy Spirit to connect people with what they need to hear. We've just got to put it out there. I mean, it, it's, it's Ecclesiastes, isn't it? Mm. Cast your bread on the waters, and then then the Lord will use it. So um, that's what we, 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 we keep the faith. We say our prayers. We preach the gospel, uh, either in a building or on the internet, and God will do and, what he wants. But it's more than that, Gavin, and it's what you demonstrated in Jersey this past week that you go and you preach the gospel no matter the temperament of the audience. Mm. And we, may, we may not have seen, it's not, you're not Jimmy Swaggart. People are not slain in the spirit and thrown on their crutches as you preach. But we know that God is at work in their hearts and in their souls. And you're being used as an instrument for that transformation. And I just want to, say, Holy I, I want to say an enormous thank you for people who are supportive. People supportive in a number of ways um, by by praying, uh, but by writing and um, by by gratitude, uh, and as to some by practical support. And all these three ways have been enormously helpful. And, and I know you guys too get an enormous amount of encouragement from from the sort of the sense of collaboration that we have with people who share this ministry with us on the internet. So I, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, it, it, it's it's hugely helpful. So right below our names right now, you're seeing our Facebook um, links. So you can friend us on Facebook if you have not. Uh, please do so because Gavin posts his morning prayers there. George uh, gives wonderful updates as well. And I just post pictures of car accidents I'm in. So that's just <laughs> what's going to happen. The, the, the angels have <laughs> saved you in yes. death. Bro. Oh, my gosh. Jesus. I, I <laughs> keep the angels busy, yes. There is one thing. Uh, as a, What are the practical things? Uh, one of our viewers very kindly sent me the money to repair this thing. Oh, oh cool. good. Oh. <laughs> so, if the sound sounds better. It and, does. Uh, yeah. If the sound sounds better this week and last week compared to previous six months, I had broken the thing and uh, it did not hold together well with duct tape. And the money came in, and I can't really squeeze money out of Mrs. Conger to pay for these things. No. And, they, and then you think Mrs. Conger's tight, Mrs. Coulson. Oh, <laughs> Mrs. Coulson's like, I'm going to go film an unscripted, like an official thing. Oh, you're going to go talk to your friends? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm trying to change the world, dear. I know. I know. The, gift, you know, the sort of small gifts. Um, we don't run to the liquor store and cash the checks. We mm -hmm. use them to basically purchase and refurbish and do the things to allow us to carry on this ministry. And to that, I say thank you. Yeah, absolutely. We all say thank thank you. You. A huge thank you. Now, if you feel like you want to give right now, I want to give to Anglican Unscripted. Go to Anglican Inc. It's Anglican.inc forward slash donate. There's a little button there you can click and, and help donate, send a check, whatever you want. Uh, we'll be raising more money as time goes on because we want to send some people to Lambeth and some other things next year. Um, George, you're going to New Wineskins? I'm going to the pre-conference at New Wineskins, okay. 23rd, 24th, 25th, I think. I will be filming New Wineskins again and, and broadcasting it live for the world to see. Uh, do watch the New Wineskins Facebook page if you've not signed up for that. Um, just go to Facebook and type New Wineskins and it will come up and you can be, uh, like that page as well. I will also put it in the show notes. Can I mention something, Gavin, that uh, uh, in the past we have made arch references to my disappearing to destinations unknown for the month of November. And now it's all been finalized where I've actually got the visa and the tickets done. I have taken a second job. I am a seasonal chaplain at St. Bart's, St. Bartholomew's Church on the island of St. Bart's in the French West Indies. No so, kidding. Huh. Yes, I will be the... Uh, Gavin, help me with my pronunciation. The Abbe 
Abbey of uh, Gustavia, which is the name of the town, oh, or the yeah. curé. <laughs> Père, Père Georges Curé, le l'abbé de Gustavia. C'est Incroyable. Mais Père. oui, mais oui. <laughs> and actually, one of the first things I have to do is uh, I have to do Remembrance Sunday because it's comp- uh, because it's France and they evidently celebrate the First World War, and I also have to do a celebration for the Swedish community because the uh, Church of England parish in that Anglican parish on that island also serves the Swedes. Uh, so I'm going to have to get out my Church of Sweden prayer book and try to learn some Swedish for the occasion. Cool. That'd be fun. No, not cool. It's going to be a yeah. fiasco. <laughs> That's all we do. The three of us are just a walking fiasco. That's why you watch us. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm the Abbe of Gustavia. <laughs> the Cure de Gustavia. George yeah. Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, giving thanks to God that, that Kevin is in one piece still, and you've been listening to episode 533 of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>